spaces where coming out would pose a problem, the first thing I do is come out because I want to be my most authentic self in whatever space I'm in. The frustration is totally understandable. It's real. It can be really painful and put you into a spiral that can be really damaging and difficult to get out of. But knowing that ultimately being a part of the queer community means more than any other label, I think would have really helped me a lot in high school. And I know a million people every day look at you and say it gets better and that kind of fake voice and it's you know a whole anti-hate campaign you're like okay you're saying it's gonna get better but is it really gonna get better and I'm telling you it got so much better but once you feel like you are safe be unapologetic be unshameful in your identity and who you are. You will only love yourself more for it. And years down the line, when you realize that you have told your story and you do find joy in who you are, you will thank yourself, you will love who you are, and you won't remember the times that you felt as if you were hiding in the closet. Rates of depression and anxiety and substance abuse and, and assault and basically all of the terrible things in the world are higher for queer communities because we've been taught to hate ourselves and you just gotta learn to love yourself through all the adversity. So for queer people of color, I think also having to function as students is an especially difficult and daunting task because that's something that, you know, society doesn't warn you about and kind of Coping with these difficult situations is something that I've had a lot of trouble with. And for me, my way of confronting my trauma and the world around me has been through activism. I think probably the hardest thing for me when I came out in high school was not knowing what label to use. Am I bi? Am I a lesbian? Like, I'm not sure if I still like guys or if I don't. And I, re I really agonized over this decision for a long time because I was like, what if I come out as a lesbian and then I have a crush on a guy later? Like, what happens? And like, it's, are, are people not gonna let me do that? All of my friends, like most of us are just like, no, we're queer, like whatever. Um, but we all had that experience in high school where we were like so desperately wanted a community to identify with and so much of that was finding a label that fit. The coolest part about coming out was having younger people at my high school come up to me and say I'm queer too and I didn't tell anyone until just now and I didn't know there were other queer people in my immediate vicinity and I was like yes oh my god let's get together and knowing that like regardless of what your specific identity is within that community, you have an entire new family and group of people who you can talk to and confide in, regardless of if they're bi or pan or whatever. And so trying to find that label, if that's something important to you, absolutely, I implore you to do that. But know that it's not going to entirely change your world and define who you are, and it's okay to be uncertain or to just want to stick within an umbrella or a general term for now. That's totally okay, too. Do what you feel is right for you in the moment. and. You know, we talk about like being closeted, but sometimes you're not in the closet because other people are putting you in. Sometimes you just, you need to be there for a little bit longer and that's okay. It's hard to justify yourself constantly, but you don't have to justify yourself to yourself anymore. Staying safe is not shameful. In fact, it's more courageous to maintain your safety until the time is right. Good evening. My name is Dr. David Humphrey. My pronouns are he, him. I serve as Senior Vice President, Equity and Justice Officer for the YMCA of Greater Seattle. Welcome to the YMCA of Greater Seattle's Pride Month, Why Conversation entitled, Building the Bridge to LGBTQIAA Plus Liberation. Before moving forward, I would like to acknowledge that the YMCA of Greater Seattle's branch location, education, and campsites reside on the stolen lands of the Coast Salish peoples. As we live, work, and play on these territories, we must keep in mind the ongoing effects of colonization, communities of struggle for self-determination, colonial state violence, and the recognition of indigenous sovereignty. Marsha P. Johnson, Black, transgender activist, sex worker, drag performer, prophet, and one of the leaders of the Stonewall and Uprising once stated, quote, 
you never completely have your rights, one person, until you all have your rights, end quote. Her prophetic, intersectional, and ancestral wisdom tapped into the pulse and rhythm of resistance and liberation that can only happen through collective solidarity, made possible only by centering the wisdom, strategies, ways of being, knowing, and loving of those who are the most impacted by racism and its intersections. QT BIPOC folks. Today's conversation is critical because as Angela Davis once wrote, quote, freedom is a constant struggle, end quote. Recent SCOTUS rulings have merely reminded us of what we have already known, that no one's rights are secure. No one is never truly free unless we all are free that the struggle for freedom and liberation continues. So today's conversation is centered around the question, how do we work and co-conspire together to build and enact a framework of liberation for LGBTQIA plus folks? Welcome to our sacred space. During the program, please direct your questions by chatting with the co-host Q&A chat. We will share the questions with our moderator during the QA panel as time allows. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Patrick Carr. Patrick Carr is the YMCA of Greater Seattle, District Director of Membership in South King County. He works with staff members and the Seattle community to provide technical ex expertise, empathy, support, and leadership. Patrick has worked for the YMCA for 13 years and over those years, Patrick has had the opportunity to support various communities in Seattle, such as Bellevue, Central District, Shoreline, and now West Seattle, Fauntleroy. Patrick is a certified team leader and, deep engage, and deeply engaged with LGBTQIA plus community as a chair of the local and national LGBTQIA plus employee resource network for the YMCA. I would also say Patrick is the bomb diggity. Uh, Patrick is a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion work in community as an advisory board member of Gay City. Patrick's superpower, among many, is building quality relationships and collaborating to create stronger communities. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Patrick Carr. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and thank you, uh, Dr. D. I appreciate that very, very warm welcome. Um, I am Patrick Carr, uh, he, him pronouns, District Director of Membership uh, here at the YMCA. I'm also a fierce advocate uh, for equity and justice. Uh, tremendously excited today to be here and create a space of conversation about the absolute imperative of liberation and human rights at this time. Um, welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome again to the Pride why community conversation uh, entitled Building the Bridges to LGBTQIAA plus liberation. Uh, today's why com community conversation will uplift and call attention to the diverse LGBTQIAA plus community. Today, we will share space with one another as we march forward from points of great adversity and points of tremendous triumph. We recognize everyone's experience is their own and hold this space where no one's uh, persons, no one person's voice shall outweigh the other. Today, we recognize the roots of the pride movement and that it began with black trans women uh, that paved the way for us to be able to have the conversation we're having today. We honor their legacy by challenging the status quo and centering the conversations on struggles, strides, and celebrations. Uh, before we jump into the conversation, let's take a moment and introduce our guest panelists for the evening. Uh, I'm excited, very excited to welcome Jai and Kai. Kai is the co-executive director of programs at Gay City. And Jai is the youth advocacy program manager at Gay City. Uh, let's get to know our panelists a little bit more. Uh, we'd like to provide a space for each panelist to introduce themselves, the role they serve in, their pronouns, and share the work they're doing. Hi, um, I'm Jay. I use they, them pronouns, or if you're a Mandarin speaker, Ta. 
Um, I'm the Youth Advocacy and Creative Programs Manager at Gay City. So I manage our youth programs as well as um, our arts programs. Um, and one like specific area that I really care about is the role of art in our liberation. Yeah, thank you so much, Y team. Hello, everyone. My name is Kai. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am navigating laryngitis, so please bear with me as I have a frog in my throat uh, today as I'm chatting with you all. It's an honor to be with you all. As Patrick said, uh, I'm the co-executive director here at uh, Seattle's LGBTQ Plus Center, formerly known as Gay City. Um, I am honored to be a part of this work and to show up for our uh, queer and trans community every day, specifically our QT BIPOC community. Um, I oversee the programs of both uh, the youth advocacy team, uh, partnered with amazing folks like JE, as well as our health services programs as well. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be with you all. Thank you so much for having us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both for being here and taking the time. Uh, Kai, congratulations on your co-executive directorship. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll be fantastic at it as you are at many things. Um, but we're gonna shift now to some specific questions uh, that will enable us to understand both the urgency and opportunities inherent in seeing the issues through an intersectional and equitable lens. Um, pardon me, equity lens. Um, our first question is, how do institutions, for example, schools, healthcare, legal, um, and interconnected systems, for example, preschools to prison pipeline, use practices, policies, and programs to intentionally create barriers for QT BIPOC communities? I'll take this question. So from preschool and elementary school, when we start by separating out groups of students into girls and boys and addressing the class as girls and boys instead of saying like young scholars, young artists, friends, et cetera, and in schools and other institutions, when school, when teachers and authority figures don't respect pronouns, when school counselors are not like competent, um, when it comes to LGBTQ plus issues and so perpetuate more harm and policies that don't allow people to say walk at graduation using a chosen name or requiring things like a doctor's note to allow trans femme students to be in women's spaces. Um, and when gender and sexuality alliances and schools are white dominated and students of color might ideas queer queer trans but don't feel comfortable in those spaces. And then in terms of medically. Um, this, of course, varies by state, and I think in some ways it has gotten a lot better. Um, so about 10 years ago, I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was uh, seriously looking into pursuing uh, hormone replacement therapy and a legal name change and gender marker change. And at the time, um, in order to get HRT, the first step was getting a letter from a therapist who would like diagnose me as trans. Um, and so I'd heard about one person in that city who could do that, who is a cis white woman. Um, and I'd also heard that it was pretty hit or miss whether or not she would choose to write a letter. And so like in the first session, I like asked if she'd be willing to write the letter for me. And she's like, no, like I need to get to know you first. It usually takes about 10 sessions. And at the time I was working all kinds of gigs. So I was washing dishes for $8 an hour. I was like tutoring math. I was modeling for like a really creepy photographer because it paid way better than washing dishes. Um, and so I had to do like a lot of labor just to pay for one therapy session. Um, but I ended up doing 10 because I really wanted to be on HRT. And at the end of 10 sessions, she was like, well, I still don't really know. Um, and it's just because I didn't fit the mold of what she thought that um, a trans person should be like. And so when I moved to Seattle six years ago, I was finally able to access HRT and I still needed a therapist letter, but at least I was able to get one in a single session. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that very personal information. Um, um, my next question is focusing on one system, the mental health system. Can you give some examples of negative impacts and positive impacts the system has had on QT BIPOC persons? I'll take this one. Um, yeah, the mental health system is a huge system, right, Patrick? Like it's, it's a giant, a giant thing. So uh, I, I think I'll start by saying that um, something that Jay just said that really resonated with me about my experience as well, moving through the world as a queer and trans human that, that is also a person of color uh, and that is non-binary specifically uh, is, is that 
I am often pathologized in mental health spaces. And so many queer and trans people are so deeply pathologized as, uh, uh, you know, I am currently going through a gender health clinic uh, with my medical provider, and I had to be diagnosed with gender identity disorder in order to get the gender affirming care that I need, right? So literally called a disorder. Um, and so we are constantly being pathologized, we're constantly being pushed out of belonging, we're constantly being othered by systems, even within the mental health system, uh, which is supposed to be rooted in liberation and rooted in, in deep healing and trauma informed care. And sadly, that is not always the case. And in fact, most of the time it's not. That said though, um, although you know, there's a lot of ways in which I can look at the system, the, the mental health system and the really, really the medical industrial complex as a whole, there's also a lot of really beautiful movements happening where we're starting to see a lot more queer and trans people of color stepping into therapist roles and centering liberation as their approach to mental health uh, and gender affirming care. And so I think that what I love to see is that like, uh, as, as people of color, as queer and trans people, we're starting to destigmatize mental health and we're starting to like ask for, ask for our needs to get met, which is really exciting. Um, for me, I grew up with two immigrant parents who both thought that mental health therapy was taboo, that that would make you weak if you ever needed support. And I know so many folks that are also navigating a lot of cultural norming that's happened where uh, getting your needs met and getting the support that you need in order to feel like a whole human that's resourced uh, is, is shamed. And so we're constantly navigating internalized shame in that. And so it's like almost like a middle finger to the system to be like, you know what, like I'm allowed to get my needs met. I'm allowed to, to have support in my life. And so I think that um, all my beloveds, uh, all my beloveds that are QT BIPOC folks um, are currently experiencing or starting therapy. And I, I celebrate it every time because I think that we deserve it. And I, I think that we need more spaces where that's possible. It's also not super accessible for a lot of folks. And so it takes a certain level of privilege in order to be able to access that. And so our hope at our organization is that somehow we can start to provide that to more people uh, because we recognize that it takes a lot to find a trans competent therapist, especially a trans competent therapist who's also a person of color, right? So uh, we, we just need to keep building, uh, keep building the muscle of demanding more dignity uh, and getting our needs met. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. And I, I think I hear in both stories this personal experience of difficult systems, uh, particularly to get the things that you need to be yourself. And it makes me think about the, in general, the conversation we're having about liberation and, and how they work together. So what does liberation look like uh, for the QT BIPOC community? What, is it, what does it look like if all these systems that are currently in place are creating barriers to having your authentic self be appreciated and seen? Yeah, so liberation means being able to be who we authentically are and love who we love and to be in beautiful community without fear of rejection or violence or harm. Um, and it means being so safe and so free that there's never a reason to hide any part of ourselves or to keep ourselves small. Um, and it also means healing from colonization and intergenerational trauma. So our people are resilient and they shouldn't have to be. Um, pride is about knowing our worth, knowing that our community is beautiful and valuable, and despite knowing that harm and discrimination are still here, being visible and not giving in to cis heteronormative pressure. Of course, safety is really important, right? And safety is first. And so I think that it is possible to like still be proud and also to have to like keep yourself safe and um, not have to like not be able to disclose all of yourself, right? Um, and then I think for me, it's also choosing to be um, ourselves and choosing to love on the next generation of cutie BIPOC people so that we can all be a little bit more free. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I, I really love the idea of don't keep yourself small, right? Um, and so what we need is folks to be able to raise their voice and come out into community uh, and be able to ask for what they need. And again, destigmatize um, what's happening currently in the community with uh, the health community. Um, so what is, um, I'm sorry, creating spaces to uplift QT BIPOC stories and lives is critical. What are ways in which your organization um, is working to create intersectionality and liberated spaces? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's another really big question. And I feel like uh, as I was reflecting on the question ahead of time, the first thing that came to my mind is we're doing the very best that we can within a system that is inherently racist 
inherently transphobic, <laughs> inherently white supremacist, the nonprofit industrial complex, unfortunately, uh, makes it so that um, if we ever stop trying, it'll go right back to where, where it started, right? Uh, and so it is a constant practice as an organization to start to look at the ways in which we have perpetuated harm and been complicit in the oppression of our own community and the people that are on the margins of our own community, like at the deepest level. And so it has been such a deep uh, trans transitional and like transformative time as, a, as an organization for us. Uh, I can share a little bit of like examples about things that are happening for us that feel different and feel like they are uh, starting to uplift uh, the folks in the room that have not yet been uplifted. Um, you know, we, we are starting to ask our team internally like to make hiring decisions for leadership in the organization, which is a super important a step towards understanding how to center community and like the decisions we make. Uh, I think so often organizations, they they start with the external community and they don't realize that there's also attending to the internal community that has to happen first. So that when we're at the forefront of this work, we have solidarity amongst each other. And so that means that we have to start to have harder conversations, right? And we have to start to define accountability. We have to start to define what liberation looks like within this inherently racist system. And that means that we have to have like uh, the, the, the folks at the table that need to be there, right? So. I think for us, it's a lot about like undoing a lot of institutional harm that has predated me for sure, JE for sure, and, uh, and has been like generations, right, of, of like institutional harm that, that has really forced us into positions and moving through spaces that not are not necessarily like deeply aligned with who we are as humans outside of that context. And so we're trying to merge those things together in order to cause that create the causes for us to be able to serve our community in a way that's authentic, in a way that's actually able to uplift their voices and create safe containers for them to come into our community and know that they will be held and seen. And so that means that we need to have a more diverse group of folks at the table. We need to dismantle cis normativity at our organization. We need to dismantle anti-Blackness, transphobia, et cetera. And so that means that it's going to have to take that, that deep tending internally first. Um, that said, I think a lot of our programs currently are really uh, starting to move in that direction. I'm honored to be on this panel with this amazing human JE because they have really taken our youth programming and turned it into a completely QT BIPOC centered space. And I don't think other organizations are really like, <laughs> like at the fringe of that the same way in so many ways. And I, I'm so proud of that. And I think that like, I, I want, to encourage folks, if, they're, if you're in the room and you are part of an organization right now, to really make sure that the people at the table represent the community that you wanna be serving and trust them when they tell you that maybe something isn't hitting right or it doesn't feel right, uh, know that their experience is valid and also don't tokenize them, right? So don't assume that they know how to speak on behalf of all humans, right? So I think it's a, it's a dance and I think it just means that we need to continue to create space for folks that we wanna be serving in our internal community so that our external community can keep growing, right? So yeah. I would say like, that's, what we're, that's where we're at as an organization. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a really beautiful place to be. It feels really generative, you know? Uh -huh. I, I appreciate that. It's so, so powerful, right? The idea of like um, defining accountability and defining your liberation within the organization. And so we, we all, uh, all of us on this call exist within these institutions and we want them to be better for the communities that we serve, right? And you can sometimes recognize that the intention is there, but the impact looks a little different. Um, it, are there, do you see like, and this is just a follow-up to your answer is like, do you see, um, other ways or do you see barriers that show up in the, in the way in which the organization, um, or I should say the struggles that the organization may have to be able to see this particular goal through? So many things. I mean, first of all, capitalism, like being, you know, indebted to our funders. I think, that you part. know, even if, even if our funders are amazing, you know, and they're great humans, like they also have bosses that, <laughs> that need reporting to be done and need our work to happen a certain way. And so that sometimes means that we have to like choose the institution over the people sometimes, and that doesn't feel great. Um, 
And so th there's that, right? So the, the need for unrestricted funding for organizations like ours, like yours, Patrick, is so key for us to be able to do more liberatory praxis, you know? Um, and so I think there's that. I think also, you know, when you come together over an identity, our, our organization is so um, niche, right? Like we're not gonna get folks lining up <laughs> on the streets of Seattle wanting to work at Seattle's LGBTQ plus center. Uh, although we're amazing, not everybody is resonating with our with our work, right? Because that's just where we at, are at. As a, as a as a culture and that's okay and so we have like folks that come to the table that have lived experience that have like so much deeply rooted trauma in being a person in these identities moving through the world and we come together and it's right here it hits right here right like everything's right here on the chest and it's it's in the heart and it, we feel it so deeply and so sometimes it's really easy to revert back to like like ways of comfort, right? Like ways of doing things that feel like we've always done it that way, right? Because everything else feels so tender. So sometimes it's it's easy to revert back. And so I think, I think it's so many things, but I think those two things have been really interesting to observe in myself and others when we're moving through our organization and trying to make these, these changes that I named earlier. Um, it's just knowing that, you know, every step we take, there's so much risk but in the risk, there's so much liberation and joy, right? But like, yeah. it is it is really challenging to do something differently when no nobody around you is modeling that, right? So like, mm -hmm. and that's not to say we're so amazing and nobody is doing this. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying for us as historically, we have not done this. And so that's that's where it's like, we really need to continue to, to like check in with each other and be in solidarity and have real relationships with each other too. Yeah, no, you're right. No, um this is you're not no not everybody's doing this then like I would what a small percentage of people out here in the world institutions in the world actually thinking about what power share looks like or that uh, accountability model you were referring to or even considering their staff's perspective uh from a liberatory lens you know that it's transformational work right uh indeed bound to be messy by the fact of hum humanity <laughs> but um a cause worth taking up Right, and we all, like I said, we're in these organizations, and we all have the same intention um, to to make sure that our communities get what they need. Um, and so, uh, my next question is: How does your current work or pro programming create space for liberated thinking, uh, and particularly practices amongst young people? Yeah, so we have a lot of programs here, but before I talk about our programs, I actually just want to say that. Um, I think that change happens relationally. Um, and so, yes, we live in like big systems and institutions and there's harm at the institutional level, but mm, healing and change happen like together. Um, and so for me, I think that when I move through space, when I move with my team, um, I really try to like see them as whole people so share meals together and like check in. And I think that um, being able to be together in that way, because all of us on the youth advocacy team are cutie BIPOC, right? We are um, like a very gender expansive team. And that's part of what makes like the team that I'm on feel like so safe, right? And so knowing that, I think that we try to bring that into our programs as well. And so most of our programs are entirely cutie BIPOC, but not all of them are. Um, and we're pretty intentional about what those are. So for example, uh, we have a youth advisory council. And so our youth advisory council is a leadership group and they make a lot of decisions um, that impact our organization and impact our programs um, and because it's a leadership program it is really important to us that it is an entirely cutie bipoc um, community of young people um, we also have a program that is just starting up right now which is our queer peer mentors program it's the first year of the program um, we just began the training for our mentors last week. Our training is continuing to this week and then the week after we're going to meet our mentees. And so um, when we started it, we had this goal of it being a minimum of 85% BIPOC um, and which is actually like very easy, right? Um, to 
get to. Like it's something where like when we're reading these applications and reading what people have to say, um, like it just comes through, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're able to like choose people who shine. And I think for us, um, we wanted to just like be aware of like what kind of power dynamic might happen. Like if we were to like pair like uh, a white mentor, you know, with like a mentee who is a person of color, like what is that dynamic like? And not really wanting that, right? Um, because I think it's really important to have people that we are able to look up to who also look like us um, and who have like shared experiences with us. Um, and then in addition to our Queer Peer Mentors program, um, we also have our youth advocacy media team, um, which creates uh, social media about a range of topics. And that was also something where our goal was to have 85% minimum BIPOC. Um, our youth arts programming, which this year was sort of like in some ways like accidentally 100% BIPOC. Um, like we were always like going in with this mindset of being like 85% minimum. Um, but we just have like a lot of cutie BIPOC who like come through, right? And so both our media arts club and our youth arts programming ended up being 100% cutie BIPOC this year. Um, and then our programming, all of those programs also are stipended, right? So we pay our young people for their labor. We pay our young people for their learning. And then especially when we're thinking about like those opportunities for funding, um, it's really important to us that we like, that we center cutie BIPOC people there too. Um, and part of it is this sort of idea of targeted universalism and wanting to create spaces that um, center people who are like the most impacted by systems of violence first. Um, and then our programs that are open to anybody, we have a virtual um, as well as an in-person drop-in center. Um, and of course, our pride programming are also open to anyone. Um, and yeah, so in general, our programs are spaces for celebration and community and where there's access to resources and access to caring cutie BIPOC adults who are invested in the well-being of our communities. Thank you. Uh, and that's like, <laughs> that's so much work <laughs> uh, when you think about it. Um, it makes me think of the experiences of young people in these particular types of programs and like, if you could recall from your experience something that was very impactful for you or like a, a memory that really expressed what it looked like or, or an experience where you saw um, a young person expressing themselves coming out of that shell and creating liberation for themselves. Yeah, so my prior experiences as a teaching artist, and so I think the programs I end up being like really excited about, like really getting like my own like hands deep in it um, the most are our arts programming. And so I think that we just had the media arts club. And so in our media arts club, we had um, 10 weeks of classes where we were able to provide an iPad and a stylus and a teaching artist who came in who taught a number of different skills. Um, and then our young people were able to have their artwork printed. Um, and they also received a stipend for all of that. And then the last part is just like celebrating with us at Pride. And it was really the best art class I've ever taught. And I have been teaching art for a really, really, really long time. But I, in the past, have taught art like in schools and after school. And this might be the first time that I have been in a space where everyone wanted to be there, like mm -hmm. really wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I just like found myself like bragging about my young people all the time, like these young people are so talented. They're so amazing. Look at this artwork. Um, and yeah, um, those young people like are just like, wow, are there more opportunities where we like get to like make art? And I'm like, yeah, definitely like come into our drop-in center. Um, and like, yeah. And 
I think uh, for our adult programming too, we like got another grant recently to like pay artists. And so that's also been an opportunity to just like reach out to Cutie BIPOC artists and community to do workshops with us, to like perform at Pride um, or um, like create something that um, resonates with our community. And that too has felt like really wonderful to be able to like pay Cutie Bi BIPOC artists, right? Because like this other part is just feeling like artists deserve to get paid. Like um, there like needs to be ways for like art to like exist um, in our communities in a way that is like, where we're not like expecting free labor um, because like the art that our young people make and the art that these like established Kitty BIPOC artists have made um, just makes our work so vibrant and alive, right? Um, and so even now, like, so a huge portion of our funding comes from youth tobacco and marijuana prevention. And like at first when I knew about this, I was like, oh, like, what is this about, right? Um, like, is this something that is like, like how, how is this done in a way that, that is liberatory um, and not in a way that's stigmatizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, it took like a little bit of like noodling on it and talking with our like uh, funding partners on it because I know that like Mission Drift is like really common in nonprofits where there's like this um, desire to like follow the money, right? Um, but then through art, I felt like we were able to tell our stories in a way that our um, funding partners understood. So I think for me, I didn't want to stigmatize the use of like tobacco, um, cannabis drugs, because I think that uh, when people use substances, many times it is like from a place of self-medication, from a place of being impacted by all these systems of violence, right? Um, and I also think that substance-free spaces are really necessary. Um, so many spaces like for queer people are queer bars, right? Um, are like parties, are places where substances are um, prioritized and normalized. And so I think having a space to come in where there is no pressure to use substances, no pressure to buy anything um, and to just be and hang out is actually really important. And so um, we have tried to shift our language um, away from um, youth tobacco and marijuana prevention to celebrating substance-free spaces, celebrating substance-free lifestyles. Um, and um, so we don't ask our young people like what their choices are outside of like outside of being with us, just that like when they're with us that they stay substance free. Um, and um, so our young people like I was able to like pay like a you know, young people to like make a post on like an illustration for Instagram that celebrates substance free spaces and they like get a hundred dollars to like draw some artwork and like these young people who like really want to be artists are like, wow, I get to get paid, you know, to do something like that. Right. And like, so that feels good too. Right. It felt like, mm -hmm. oh, because I was able to like pay them for their labor and able to like provide the supplies that were necessary that it didn't feel like I did not want it to feel extractive at all, like what that relationship was. And then also, so when we do that, um, we try to be very like one to one about like what our messaging is. So although our funding partner like really wants us to have messaging around like tobacco and marijuana, like, okay. And protective factors are really important too. So these protective factors are um, things like gender affirming care and gender affirming care could mean HRT, but it also means socially being like um, affirmed in their gender too, right? <laughs> um, it means being in spaces that are safe. It means like um, being able to express the things that our young people want to express too. And so if I am paying a young person to make some kind of artwork for us that is um, about celebrating substance free spaces, then they also get the opportunity to make artwork of their choice that we will also post and also pay them for. I mean, 
Fantastic. I mean, in the way that you can allow these spaces and also pay people for their labor, that's such a big deal. You know, I, I think of organizations and programs where the young person is seen as a means to an end uh, and not necessarily um, guided in the way that they have the opportunity to uh, harness their abilities and also get paid for it. Because uh, that's that's real. That's, that's actually the real world. People get paid for the work that they do. Um, and so that shouldn't change just because that's a child or a younger person, you know. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for sharing. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody is riveted by um, your input and the, the, the ways in which you do your work and provide space for young folks. Um, we do have a two minute uh, section for question and answer. So if you're on this call right now and I'm uh, scrolling through the, the boxes to see zero, no, only a few faces here, but a lot of names that I recognize. And I would be very happy if you had some questions from uh, this conversation that you wanted to post in the chat, that would be great. Um, and we can um, ask our panelists. So I'll give it a, a half second beat. <clears throat> I also do have, um, I have one question to, to get started. Um, in your opinion, and neither of you can answer this question, um, what are the most critical changes the LGBTQIA plus community must make to face the future effectively um, as we continue to strive for equity and inclusion? I mean, I'll start off and Jay, please, <laughs> fill in for me, but um, I think a, a danger, right, and coming together over identity, uh, when you're doing DEIA work, right, like so often you become like part of this affinity group and you become part of this acronym, and I think, you know, LGBTQIA plus uh, really encompasses a lot of different bodies and identities and, and humans and the ways in which they show up. And I think that we fall into traps as, as people who have been um, sort of like socialized by a very sanitized culture to assume like that certain groups are monolithic, right? And I think that what happens in those spaces sometimes, like when we all come together and we don't normalize the fact that we also need to do power analysis and a power assessment of like who holds the most power and privilege in this space and how much space are you actually taking up in that, in that way? we really miss the mark as far as getting to a point of liberation together. And in fact, we create divisiveness in our, in our, in our own community, right? By, by not understanding that even within the context of being a queer person in the world right now, there's someone in your community that is most definitely also navigating like trauma and harm and, and also like joy and, and all of these things, right? And I think that we have to have more conversations together as an, as, as a community around power and privilege. And we need to start to understand like the ways in which we need to move aside or like <laughs> make space or take space or whatever that looks like. And I think um, so often queer spaces have been in my experience of just joining queer things around, you know, the Pacific Northwest have been super white dominant, have been um, super cis dominant. And I think that uh, there's a lot of assumptions that are made around like, that we are all the same and that 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 you know a cis white person will understand my experience right and the thing is is that that's probably not true um and we have to be okay with that like that can be really generative if we got to the point where we could be like wow how exciting to be in a room with different people right like mm -hmm. but i think that difference has been conditioned to be like dangerous to so many of us and i think it keeps us from getting to the point of freedom because we keep hitting this like comfort zone thing and and I'm, I'm complicit in that as well, right? And I think that if all of us were doing that deeper work internally, showing up in community in a more like radical way, we could get to a point where like, we could move through space and feel a little bit freer, right? Like, and I, and I think that that's kind of where my mind went with your question, Patrick, is just around <laughs> like, not assuming that any community is monolithic, you know? And, and I think that's a really important first step to us getting free together is, is that. Right, right, yeah. You know, stop putting people in boxes because <laughs> we're all we're all very much different. Um, and uh, again, no monoliths um, in the human condition. Um, and there's only space for 
us to be able to collaborate really if we want to move past this the way we've made the world now we want to move past that but we got to get out of that comfort and i appreciate i appreciate that perspective so i'm getting i'm you know i'm getting people's uh responses here and this is blowing up on this uh on this chat box. I'm, hopefully I can keep up with it. Um, one of the questions that came through from Greg is um, because you're doing so much work around like rethinking how um, Seattle's LGBTQ Center is remaking even its power structure, its leadership, right? Um, is there a best practice guy being developed from the success that you've had um, and that person also said, thank you so much for this informative, important conversation. Greg, I don't know you if you want our toolkit. I don't think you want ours. <laughs> <laughs> it's mess. It's mess. The answer is mess now. <clears throat> I was going to say, um, so the Transgender Economic Empowerment Coalition is working on a model employment policy toolkit. Um, and Gay City is also part of that conversation. That toolkit is not quite ready for public release yet, but we will let you know um, when the model employment policy toolkit is ready. Fantastic. Um, the next question, and I didn't put a name here, but um, what are some LGBTQIA plus outreach groups where questioning teens can meet um, one another in Kent, Washington. You may or may not know that. I don't know. So we actually have an online drop-in. So in addition to our physical space, we also have a virtual drop-in center. So our virtual drop-in is every Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Um, and um, you can sign up on our website. So it is gaycity.org slash youth and the link to register um, is there and it is a pretty fun space so um, we'll like play games together there's um, room to just like chat and get to know each other um, yes so i recommend our virtual drop-in center um, as a way to connect and hopefully in the future um, there will be more in-person ways to connect beyond seattle as well dope Thanks for that. Good plug uh, for the work. Um, and I have another question. Okay. So uh, this uh, looks like Jennifer wrote, I loved hearing Jay's response to your question on a really rewarding experience in this work. Um, and this person would love to hear Kai's response as well. Yeah, thank you. Th Jennifer, was that the name? Shout out to Jennifer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I, yeah, I think for me, something that has felt really rewarding, honestly, has been uh, the youth advocacy team internally. Uh, I, I feel really moved every day, uh, basically to tears. Jay can, can, can attest to this. I'm often moved to tears by just like the stories that I, that I get to bear witness and, and listen to and, and, and be a part of. And, and I think that for me every day, it's like a dream come true, literally not to be cheesy, like to be surrounded in community deeply in my work with other QT BIPOC folks who are like deeply committed to like our, our future, like a future where like we can exist and like it, and we can not only exist that like, it'll be like really great that we're here. And I think that like so many of us have lived uh, in a it, growing up, like I grew up in a way that, um, was super shame, uh, like so shame inducing all the time. And honestly, going to Youth Pride at Mopop this past week and seeing all these young people take up all this space, I was teary eyed like so many times throughout the night because it was just like, wow, like we are doing this. Like this is literally happening. And yes, it's, it's only in one place in Seattle, but it's happening. And like, it was so cool to watch. It was so cool to see young people like dress how they want and put seven different pronoun pins on their on their outfit and just like the whole thing just felt really like amazing to to be able to be a part of that you know so i think um to answer your question jennifer i think it happens every single day literally uh and this past week especially was like yes and it sold out which was amazing uh, -huh. uh so it was really cool it was just so cool to see young people take up space and have fun and and know that they were held like know that they can just even if it's just for these couple hours, they can be held and have a good time with each other, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and of course I was like, like the adult that was kind of like hovering just to like observe because <laughs> I was so moved and just like very like 
I was so in uh, in love with their conversation. They they would make friends like this, and it was like it was like seeing each other in each other. And I was just thinking mm. like, wow, I wish that like everybody could have this, not just young people, but every single human in the world could have a moment of being clearly seen by another. Um, yeah. And so that space was that for for me, and I, I really appreciated it a lot. Love that. I'm I'm picturing you in my head as a proud parent, like looking over their shoulders and taking photographs and like wiping your eye. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. I have I have uh, another question also from Kimber. Um, what are some of your sources of hope? Um, how do you continue to show up in this work when things get challenging? Yeah, I mean, I think a big source of hope is our team. So Sam from our team is here today, um, just like in the audience. And so it's so nice to be like, oh, wow, Sam's here too. He's here to like, listen and support us and stuff. Um, and like, we gave a little shout out and like Dana and like on the chat was like, good luck today, you're gonna do so great, right? And I was just like, oh, you know, like our team is always just like gassing us up, right? And just like, um, so I think even when the work is hard, I know that I am deeply committed to the team of people that I'm with. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, and I do have another one from Lisa. Um, and how can the Y support and work together with you slash your organization to better serve? Well, Lisa, thanks for that. Uh, Patrick has been an amazing partner, honestly. I've really loved working with Patrick so far. Um, I think the more we can just get to know each other and understand how we can also support y'all because y'all have you know, access to a bunch of young people that are just like looking for community. And so I think that, you know, I think there's going to be a desire from, from us definitely. And I hope from the Y as well to like actually do like a joint event together in the future. And um, also if you all have any sort of social media platform or if you're um, engaged at all with other young people or folks that are serving young people, like talk about our work and community. It's okay if you mess up. It's okay if you don't know exactly what that, that thing was that Jay mentioned in this call, you know, just like maybe just mention our website and know that like uh, whoever you send our way, we will welcome them with like open arms and like a curious mind and like <laughs> and like try and get their, their needs met in some way uh, because we wanna build our community and we want um, as many young people as possible to have access to these affirming spaces that we keep talking about. So I would say that um, you can be our, our, uh, our cheerleader out in community and we would greatly <laughs> appreciate it. And, and we do the same uh, for you all as well. Of course. And also, like, please feel free to email after because I'm thinking like, oh, it would be really cool like if we collaborated and had like a way for young people to have access to like fitness resources, right? Like if there was like a cutie BIPOC only like dance class or something that could be held at a Y um, that was like free or something, right? Um, mm -hmm. That was told by a cutie BIPOC instructor. Um, mm -hmm. And so that dance teacher is getting paid. The young people don't have to pay to get there. Maybe we're even able to do like transportation reimbursement for our young people too, right? Um, and having like that kind of space would be really cool. I know that our young people are like really asking for like more in-person programming and it's tricky, it really is. Um, and I also think that like gyms, right, can be like really like, can be tricky spaces for people who are gender non-conforming. Um, and like when I'm thinking about like, oh, like what to like, dressing rooms look like? Are there like spaces where um, people can like change where there's like more privacy where they isn't like where, where no one's like forced to like um, go into like something that is labeled a men's restroom or something that's labeled a women's restroom? Mm -hmm. um, like are there like gender neutral swim times or like uh, like cutie BIPOC swim hour or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those might be potential ways for collaboration. And if any of those ideas like sparked interest or something else, um, please feel free to email. Uh, my name, email is just my first name at gaycity.org. So uh, je at gaycity.org. Um, and it's also on our website too. So if you're like, I don't remember how to spell their name or something, <laughs> you can just go on our website and it's listed there. Love it. 
Uh, and uh, thank you, Kai, for posting. I was just going to say, can you post those? And then there was also another mention to call out the links and resources that you've been uh, so generous with today. Can you post them here in the chat? Uh, and someone said, asking as the parent of a 13-year-old who is exploring. So already making connections. I love that. It's beautiful. Uh, I do have one last question. I think we have time to put in one last question. And it is uh, from Samantha. And Samantha would like to hear, um, she would love to hear Kai's answer to the last question of what gives you hope in this work? Thank you, Samantha. I can't see your face, but I'm sure you're adorable. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I think what brings me hope is so similar to what Jay said. I feel like uh, for me, um, I'm on my own journey of like radical self-love and like really trying to take up space as a queer and trans person in this world. And I think that every day is so tender. Every day is so, so, so tender. And there are so many opportunities to doubt myself and to feel ashamed and to fall into patterns of uh, unworthiness or not belonging. And then I go to work and I see this beautiful group of humans that I get to work with every day. And everything just sort of melts away and gets uh, dissolves just a little bit. And I think that um, the way in which hope feels and how, how hope moves is often like coupled with grief a lot, you know, like, and I think there's something really beautiful about that, that like hope and grief can take up space together simultaneously and like not be a binary, right? Like it can be this like very fluid experience of being both like so griefful and also so hopeful at the same time. Um, and I think the more hope that one can feel, it's, it's, it comes from a place of like, deeply knowing that like this is not all there is right like another world is possible and really believing that and so I think that just being surrounded both personally and professionally by these amazing humans that also have hope and have also felt deep grief uh brings so much hope into my system every day um and that doesn't mean it's easy it's really difficult some days uh but just knowing that that's possible is is very um very hope inducing so yeah <laughs> Thanks, Kai. Um, and a very like appropriate sentiment for the times that we live in currently to try to remain deeply hopeful um, um, in, in times when maybe it feels like things are not going their best. So um, with that, I want to thank you both, Jay and Kai, uh, for being with us today. Um, and all of our audience, uh, we hope this has been a meaningful time for you today. Uh, we invite you to share your feedback. The feedback link is here in the chat. Uh, Toy Pie dropped it for us. Um, also in the chat, if you would uh, share one word to express how you feel about today's conversation or a quote that your panelists said that really resonated, um, please share that with us in the chat box. For me, it was, uh, Jay said, healing and change happen relationally and together. And I thought, mm-hmm, right there. Yep, I, I felt that deeply. Um, so we invite everybody to explore our resources that we uh, uh, shared in the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll share a recorded copy as well um, of this video along with the resources from the PowerPoint slide with all uh, that attended or registered for this community conversation. Also, we invite you to our future uh, Y community conversations in September as we explore the Y um, Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, Heritage Month offerings are free and open to all. Uh, lastly, I'll say thank you for joining us this evening. Stay safe. And I very much appreciate you hanging out this long to uh, learn and love with us together in community. Thank you. <laughs>